Everybody say hi to Josiah. Hello, Josiah. <laughs> so I'm recording this so that he'll be able to, to hear because he really wanted to be here tonight, but his work has sent him, I think it's down south. So, so we're recording that. So this is our second week uh, in the book of Revelation. Uh, last week was more or less just kind of an overview. And who could remember or who would like to share why knowing the overview or background of any book that you're going to read, why it's important for us to take a few moments and read over the background of a book. If you have a Bible that's not just the Bible, more than likely when you open up to a book, say Ecclesiastes or Ephesians, it'll have background information in it. Uh, some of you may read that, some of you may not, but why would you say it's important that we understand the context before we read it? You understand the context. Because mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't just... Uh, you have an idea on exactly what, who is this being written for and why and when and where. It makes more sense than by just opening a book and just thinking you know exactly what it's about when it's not really. Why would you say that Solomon in Ecclesiastes or Paul in Ephesians or Colossae, Colossians to the Colossae Church, why do you think he didn't put any of that at the beginning of his letters? Yeah, he kept reading on after they heard what was going on. He just took care of them. Okay. Wasn't necessary. Why? Um, actually, no. I lost my thought, train of thought there. That's kind of what I was going to, because they're living at the time of the letter. So if we were writing today about what we're experiencing in 2020, I'm not going to have to go to each of you and kind of give you an overview of, of what's going on in the world around. We're living it. We're experiencing it. We know it. We know what's happening. So I don't need to give all these caveats about here's what's happening in the world today. You guys are living it. So I can just go right into and even say things that you'll be like, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. But people, you know, 500 years from now or 2,000 years, they may not understand the same thing. And so a lot of things that we have to be careful of when we read the Bible is are we reading it through American 2020 lens? It's kind of 2020, get it perfectly? Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, sorry. Um, are we reading it through American living in the year of 2020 or are we reading it through the first century church that this was written to and then we can understand what's being said? That's what we need to do because if we read it through the lens of where we are right here and right now, we're going to read it differently. They probably didn't have Coca-Cola cake. That's sad. That's, you know, obviously God loves us more. But we, nor Josiah, had Coca-Cola cake. So, sorry, um, Josiah. Sorry, Josiah. Uh, so being able to read the book in the setting that it was in is going to help us to know. And so, first of all, Revelation is the work of God in the world, the consumption of his rescue plan. And so Revelation as a whole is a letter written to a specific, specific people to address the specific situation they were facing. And as I said, many think it is written to America today. There's many false teachers, many false prophets, people write books. Everybody's fascinated with Revelation. Everybody is. And so you can write a book about the end times and probably be a bestseller. You may have no clue what you're talking about. And most of them don't, but you can be a bestseller because everybody wants to know what's happening. The Left Behind series, it's trash, forgive me for saying that. But it, but it kind of is, actually it really is. But man, they are best-selling, amazing, amazing, because people are so interested. And I say it's trash because most of everything in there is, again, it's, it's fictional based on a storyline that they're creating. And so you're not going to want to get your eschatology from that um, it does have application to us today revelation does have application to us today but it more closely resembles the church in china and middle east than it does to america so what they were going through during that time more closely resembles the persecution the underground church the things that are happening over in china as well as in uh, the middle east so how many of you know, like, what, tr you hear me, we'll pray for China at times. How many of you really know what's going on over there in the church right now? The 
it's got work to do, but it supports mm -hmm. it. Yeah, haven't they started um, persecuting the one Muslim group or something? It was like the bird or something? I'm not sure about remember. the Muslim group, but uh, there as was far one as group the... that was like putting like millions of them in concentration camps. Mm. Like people, like big names in China, were disappearing because they believed there's something. Hmm. Well, right now, the um, if you're a public church that is actually out in the open, you have to have their leader's picture right beside anyone that has Jesus up there. You have to have that before you can sing a song about Jesus. You have to sing a song to their leader and he must be on the same level if not above or first before you can do anything about about jesus that's what has to happen if you're going to remain public well you can imagine some churches perfectly fine with doing that they just want to meet they want to continue those are the people that i would say are more concerned about religion than they are about what god truly wants of us um, now the underground church or those who are saying no, we're not. We only we're not worshiping anybody else except God. And so they're now meeting in houses. They're meeting in different places where nobody can be found. However, people are tipping them off and they're getting raided. And you can see even videos like one was meeting at a shopping center that a person owned a store and it was closed on Sunday mornings. And so they would meet in there and then they got raided. And you see them coming in with uh, clubs and everything and beating them and arresting them and hauling them off. Um, the pastor is serving now, I think, a 12-year jail sentence for doing that. Um, and that's what's happening right now. So either you worship their leader along with Jesus or you don't. So what was going on at the church at this time? Well, what was happening during this time is you had Caesar. And Caesar wanted to be Lord. Caesar claimed to be Lord. He claimed to be God. That he wanted to be on the same level. And he actually had temples built to him. So each of the seven churches that we're going to hear about, there was a temple in that city where you would worship the current Caesar as God. And so this is what they were dealing with. Uh, right now, we're not worshiping Trump. We're not called to worship Trump. We're not being forced to or Biden. None of them have put that on a platform. So we're good for right now. But it, we, to, for us to say that we don't know what that is would be us just naive because that exact thing's happening in China right now. And so, and this uh, took place in Asia, um, the churches that were under there. So, um, so the church was under per, uh, tremendous persecution during this time. So I, I share all that because we're not under that same persecution here. I feel like it's getting worse and we're heading in that direction. It may not happen in our lifetime. It may happen in your guys' lifetime or maybe a generation after. Or it could happen in the next 10 years. I don't know. But... Uh, we're not there now, so we can't read it with that lens. Uh, the same type of thing that's happening in China where they're present. Okay, I just explained that. So in this situation, John, through the divine revelation, is writing to seven churches in his day that would understand what he's saying. Therefore, for us to fully understand what's being said, we must read it in their context and not our context. So have I been abundantly clear how we're supposed to read this? Any questions on that before we jump in? Cool. All right, so we, we looked at the first couple of verses, and my goal is to finish chapter 1 today. Uh, but we looked at the very beginning where it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. So remember, if you ever say, and you weren't there, Lavelle, so I'm telling you this now. If you ever say revelations with an S, 30 lashes, and you got to sleep with my cow for one night. <laughs> That's it. So it's revelation. It's one revelation of what is to come and of Jesus Christ. So the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. We believe John to be the apostle John, John that wrote the gospel of John, that wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. We believe that's who wrote Revelation, uh, who bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it. So last week we said, look, you are blessed because you are hearing this, and I am blessed because I'm reading it. If you want to feel blessed, if you want to put hashtag blessed on your social media profile, just start reading Revelation out loud. There you go. All right, so John, uh, in verse 4, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace 
from him who is and who was and who is to come. That's important because guess what? They're not thinking that they're very peaceful right now. They're in great turmoil, great persecution. They're being drug away. They're being beaten. They're being jailed. They're being martyred. They don't feel peace right now. So John is telling them from right from the beginning, grace and peace, or excuse me, peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Who remembers what the seven spirits were from last week or two weeks ago? Yes. Wasn't it the seven churches like representing nope. them? Or? Seven spirits. God. Which one? Well, there's only one, but which person? Uh, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Yep. So seven in this sense means uh, perfect and completion, fullness. So seven spirits would have been the Holy Spirit. Um, and then from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings. And so then, do, 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 do. let's jump down to where we are today. So... Uh, page 24 of our book is where it begins to address verses 9 through 20. It begins with these words. It says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, who is on the island of Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So John is writing to the churches that are suffering or compromising to avoid suffering. And he writes as a fellow sufferer. So the first thing we see here in verse 9 is that it's John. He's saying he's, he's not coming at them like, they're like, hey, look, I am the apostle that walked with Jesus. You need to listen to me. No, he's saying, look, I'm, John, I'm your brother in Christ. I am a fellow servant and partner in the tribulation. John is saying, look, you guys are suffering right now, but I am too. So anybody know where Patmos is? Yes. Is it an island prison? Yep. And so he was convicted. What was he convicted of? The gospel. Sharing the gospel. Yep. You didn't raise your hand. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so John was convicted because he was saying Jesus was Lord instead of Caesar is Lord. And so Caesar's not going to have competition. So because John was going around as the apostle of Jesus, going around sharing the gospel with people, he was captured, he was beaten, um, he was whipped, and he was then deported to this basically prison island called Patmos. And so uh, during that time, it wasn't a nice sprawling area with tourism that it is now. It was covered with trees and it was known for snakes and scorpions. And so he was dropped off there with no hope of being able to return back to the land. Uh, ship was the only way to and from, and he was exiled during that. He was also, uh, those that were exiled were put into to harsh labor. Uh, they were digging out caves and getting uh, qu quarry rocks or whatever to build stuff with. And so he wasn't there just sitting and praying and singing the whole time. He was under forced labor labor during that time and so he's saying look i'm john i'm your brother i'm your partner in this tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in jesus because they're patiently enduring all this persecution was on the island of patmos on account of the word of god so i'm here because of the word of god and i'm here because of the testimony of jesus so how does that yes how did he get the letter out We'll get there in just a second. Okay. Uh, how does that relate to us today? Not John's very much. testimony. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah. not very much. <laughs> just <you. Yeah. laughs> but yeah, that doesn't really relate too much. Now we can get in trouble uh, as a school teacher. Can you go in and just start sharing the gospel with your students? No. Uh, at your work, we think you'd get in trouble well, if you started sharing. You go into, into those apartments and start sharing the gospel with the people in there. Yeah, probably. You probably wouldn't keep your job. too. Long. Maybe you could. Maybe they're, they'd be understandable. Um, <clears throat> so while it's not, um, you know, you're probably not going to get jailed or whatever, there's still things that are like, yeah, that's, you probably shouldn't do that. Or probably, yeah, if you do that again, you're probably going to lose your job. Um, I've often uh, wondered when I'm uh, DJing at Cinderella's Castle stage on New Year's Eve, 
how much I could get out over the microphone system before they'd cut me off, and then, you know, because there's a lot of people. I was like, if I, how could I just in two sentences just get the gospel out there before I'm fired and told never to come back? Um, It'd be great if they had uh, Mickey about off stage. Just fine. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> now that really would be terrifying. Mickey lunges out of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Start yeah, punching yeah. Mickey in the face. <laughs> <laughs> um, Don't do it, Tony. <laughs> so, uh, verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. And so, verse 10 is saying, I was in the Spirit. And so, what John's meaning by saying that he was in the Spirit was John is about to share with us something that happened to him. This wasn't an emotional feeling that he was hap- having. It wasn't a... Uh, natural thing that was going on. What was going on was something completely supernatural. Uh, while it was real, and I'm sure it was emotional, it wasn't based off of emotions or based off of feeling. John was either transformed to a different dimension or a different dimension was brought to him. We've had that dimension talk. Uh, so something happened where he was literally in or seeing something different. He was seeing and experiencing the things as if he was there. So this wasn't like a dream that he was having. He was literally there. Who knows what the Lord's Day is? I was actually going to ask you that. <laughs> hmm? Anybody know what that is? What's that? Not his return. Rest? His rest? <laughs> his resurrection. That was resurrection. Yeah. So the Lord's Day uh, would have been on the first day of the week, which would have been a Sunday. So this happened on Sunday. Uh, that's why, if you want to know why we meet on Sundays, it's because we meet on the Lord's Day. And the early church always met on the first day of the week, called it the Lord's Day. Uh, the Seventh Day Adventists, they meet on Saturdays. The Jewish church uh, before Christ met on Saturdays. That was the Sabbath. And so now that. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath and that he has been resurrected. We now meet on Sunday. Is it wrong to meet on any day but Sunday? No. 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 What? You took my question. Okay, good. (laughs) That means I'm doing my job. Uh, No, it it is not wrong to meet on another day by Sunday. The early church met on Sundays. We continue that tradition. But if you go to a Saturday night service or you were here on Monday talking about Jesus, that's that's totally fine. It's just that's what the church started to do. So it's just tradition? Yep. And so, uh, so I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Don't put it behind me. Well, I, so, like, I, Matt, I thought that was part of decoration. Because <laughs> I'm like, yeah, hey, it kind of works with the rest of the street. So I was like, this is yours. All right. Huh? I'm trying to get loud. Could you? Why don't you play this for worship, sir? Because you never asked me. Well, you never told us. Tower of power. Or you never told me. Tower power, yep. No, I, I haven't played seriously since uh, since college. So, so what John is going to do is he's going to use terminology to help us understand when words fail. Yeah, this is the reality. What John is seeing, there's no words for it. And what's sad is even our English language today has been completely compromised, mainly by the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> Everything is awesome and tubular and cowabunga and radical, and yet they really weren't awesome and radical and tubular. They were just, that was just what every word you use, and when you use something for everything, it no longer has its meaning, right? Mm. So uh, John was trying to come up with, what can I say to share what it is I'm seeing. There's no words to truly describe what I saw, so I'm going to try to do the best that I can. And so uh, what he uses today in this bit, I heard a loud voice like a trumpet. So what would you imagine that sounding like? A loud trumpet. Well, basically he's saying it's like this. It's not exactly, but it's like this. So you want to close your ears? It's going to be loud. Am I allowed to? I thought I just said this was going to be loud. I'm excited. Nobody's going to close their ears? And you're right at me, too. That wasn't that loud. That wasn't too loud. That wasn't too loud. So let's see if I remember any of it. 
they can still do it. Yeah. All right, we're gonna have to have a meeting <clears throat> as worship team to have you play at least. I'm, I once only a remember month. like three scales. Well, and then we have remember. to play ska music. So if we can do a ska worship you, song, then we can do it. You will remember for us. So we <laughs> used it as a as a sounding because a trumpet sound in oh so I knew I would mess that up when I <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, It's the sound of God. <laughs> All right. So um, when there were wars happening and they need to sound the alarm, they would sound a bugle or a trumpet or, or a horn. They would say different things to say, if I need to make a lot of noise and get everybody's attention, that's what it would be. And so I heard from behind me this loud voice, and it was like a trumpet. So it was super loud. It was piercing. It was authoritative. It uh, demanded your attention. So these are all things that he was feeling and seeing and actually experiencing. So how do I convey that into language? And you're about to see how lost for words of the, the Greek language that John was about to be. So he heard behind him a voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book. And send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and Smyrna and to Pergamum. I'm not sure if I'm saying these right, but Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. And so, what is John meaning to say? Or, do, 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 so, let me jump in here. And so, then he goes on to verse 12 and says this. So, he hears that loud voice and he turns around and says in verse 12, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. So later, as we get through this uh, first chapter, he's going to say what the lampstands are. The lampstands are the churches. So the seven churches are the lampstands. So what do lamps produce? Light. Light. And so why would you put a light on a stand? To have it be, have its, have its light be seen by people. Yep. And so they would have these jars uh, during that time, like these clay jars. They would fill it up with the um, oil. They would have like a floating wick in it. They would light it, which would illuminate. Now, you're not going to want to put a light just off in this corner or whatever. You're going to put it on a stand in the middle of a room so it lights up the darkness. So that's a great illustration of what we are to be as a church. We are to be a light on a lampstand in the middle of the city that we are in. That's why the local church is so important is we are supposed to be the light to this world that is filled with darkness, that is running headlong into hell. We're here to say, hey, look where you're going. You're about to fall off this cliff. You don't know what you're doing. Let me point you to the, the, where you're supposed to be. And so it stands, raise it up. And gold, it says it was a uh, golden lampstands. What do you think that... Why do you think the golden lamp stands? Because they stand out. Okay. Precious. I like that. Precious. Precious. They would reflect a lot of light, making it even brighter. Okay, I like that. So precious, reflecting, maybe showing how valuable they are. How valuable would the church be? Well, Jesus would die for the church, right? Mm -hmm. The church is his bride. The church is his beloved. I mean, so the church is so important. And so he, we see that with the, the understanding of them being the light, but also them being very precious and valuable. And so here's where context matters so much. Rome, what we're about to, these next verses that we're about to get into. Rome was a powerhouse with the most amazing structures. We still go 2,000 years later to see the Colosseum. And to see all the structures that are still standing and all the different things in Greece will still go. All these Roman structures. They would have in the book, it talked about how they had all of these uh, statues to show power and might. Uh, when they would uh, defeat an enemy, oftentimes they would bring them into Rome to see all of their majesty so that they wouldn't feel like they could rebel. They would be too scared of who Rome was. It would terrify them because they were the superpower of the time. They had all the most amazing stru structures. Everything was there. So that's um, the context. And so imagine the great persecution, the incredible trials and tribulations. And then under that, all the persecution that they were going, they would probably feel completely hopeless. 
So what is John going to do now? He sees Jesus. And now he's going to say, look, you think Rome is powerful? You think Rome is mighty? You need to see what I see. So let's hear how he describes them. So in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed in a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs on his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like the flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Wow. So... That is an incredible, incredible statement. So I really loved what the book did say. So I'm going to turn to it right now as it unpacked this part. When I read this, the thing that got me was the sword coming out of his mouth. Yeah? What did it mean? What does that mean? The red sword. I mean, it's all his So listen to this. So Christ's robe in 113 may be priestly or kingly. So here's where context helps us. In the Roman army, the longer your robe, the higher your rank. So Jesus has a robe right down to his feet. But the lampstands evoke the temple, and so we should also think Jesus here is dressed as our high priest. Christ's white hair may be a sign of honor and wisdom, but primarily it's allusion to the Ancient of Days and, and Daniel. For Jesus is God, while being the Son of Man, verse 13, who receives the authority from God. The Ancient of Days sits as the judge in a courtroom, and Christ's blazing eyes in Revelation 1.14 denotes his ability to see, therefore to judge people's hearts. So again, we're the way we need to look at this is being compared to what's happening in Rome and the fear that they have of Rome versus who they truly should fear. Uh, Christ has feet like glowing bronze, which also echoes the description of the Ancient of Days in Daniel and probably denotes the purity of his judgments. But Christ's feet are primary in allusion to Daniel 10.6, as are Christ's voice being the sound like rushing water and his face being like the sun. Daniel sees a figure whose glory overwhelmed him, but who, the empowered, but who then empowered Daniel to speak of the cosmic battle which Christ would win. Christ holds seven stars, which represents God's people, at least in Daniel 12, 3. But it also counters the claims of the empire. I love this part. Coins from the reign of the emperor show his heir, who died in childhood, as the infant Zeus, playing with stars. The message was that while the death of the emperor's son meant he would never reign on earth, he was deified and now reigning in heaven. So that was like what Rome was doing. But portraying Jesus holding the stars... John claims that Jesus is the true Son of God, who having died, now truly reigns in heaven. Now to the sword. Christ's sword represents his power to judge, though its double edge may suggest Christ's words can both judge and save, wound and heal. Christ's face like the sun alludes to Daniel 10.6, which suggests Jesus is a warrior who fights on behalf of his people. So for the church that is under great persecution, fearing Rome, is now given their hero, who is stronger than Rome, more powerful than Rome, who Rome will one day be judged by, and I would even say has been judged because it has fallen. Everything that we see standing eventually falls, but Christ is still on his throne, will be on his throne until he gets off his throne to come and get us and judge the world for the final time. Uh, I want to mention, make a mention here, fall as if dead. And I don't want to go too far on this right now, but many times people will talk about how they've seen angels or they've seen uh, visions of angels or they've seen God or uh, as we were talking about two weeks ago like uh, of uh, Mormonism, how Joseph Smith saw uh, the son and the father together and we talked about why, why that's a, a problem. But when, every time somebody sees truly an angel or truly the sun they are mortified they are act as if dead isaiah said he fell to the ground as if dead here he says fell to the ground as if dead like mary was afraid when they, uh, the angels say the first words that come out of angels mouths are do not be afraid 
they are uh, for yeah yeah they're not little cherubim just flying around with harps on no these are yeah yeah go ahead i was actually gonna ask this a while ago and i forgot but i remembered aren't there like no human looking angels like aren't they all beasts with like heads and stuff well I know when they, they when they're on earth they can it seems like they're not necessarily described in that way so um I was more wondering, like, do you think I don't they know. have, like, their I haven't seen one yet, like, so. <laughs> if you really want to be confused, you watch, like, the Bible, or not confused. If you want to you have a little more of an idea, you watch the Bible project talking about angels and cher- cher- cherubim. Cherubim. I keep forgetting how to pronounce it. some that. good stuff on there. Um, so, a lot of times you'll see these books on, you know, Been to Heaven for 90 Minutes, or uh, a lot of these books, which... Uh, are written to provide comfort, but oftentimes they're very inaccurate in their understanding to the point that either they are frauds or what they saw they thought was one thing when it really wasn't. So be very cautious when reading things like that and make sure you test it to scripture because a lot of things that, that you've seen in those things, especially movies that have come out, look totally different than what we see biblically. There's hundreds of different heaven accounts, and they all contradict each other, by the way. So, just word of warning. Uh, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, again, fear not, which is always one of the first things that is said. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. That is so important because... What is happening to the Christians of the early times is they were being persecuted, even martyred during that time. Uh, Nero uh, famously puts out how he would have these great dinner parties and he would use Christians and he would dunk them in oil and, and put them up on stakes and light them on fire to light up his dinner parties. He would do that to Christians. So awful, awful time. And so people were uh, totally afraid of dying. We too today were afraid of dying. But he, we're told that, look, I am alive forevermore, and I'm the one that holds the keys to death and to Hades. So Nero does it. The Caesar does it. Nobody else does. Cancer does it. Nothing, nobody holds the keys to life and death except Jesus. He is the author of life. He is the sustainer of life. He's the author of death. Uh, and he control. I should say more or less, he controls that. And so the reason why... This is important is because we often think on this earth that death is the worst thing that can happen to us. We fear that. Brad, uh, your wife, just you guys just lost um, uh, your father-in-law. Um, but when you have a right understanding of death and a right understanding of what it means to be Christian, we no longer fear death. We shouldn't. We should not be fearful of death. Uh, I think I was talking with Michael, who couldn't be here tonight. Um, his wife Dion is, is struggling really hard because her father's in the hospital and doesn't know how much longer he has and don't, doesn't believe as a believer and so um, that is, is horrifying it is, is truly truly horrifying and so death is something that we all face and when I was talking to him I was like God could take me at any moment he could take me right now he could take me on the way home he could take me with COVID uh, Martin Luther, uh, the reformer, famously said when they were going through the, the plague of his time, he's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, sanitize, I'm going to do everything, I'm going to be safe, but if God wants me, he knows where to find me. And so um, yeah. he knows where we're at. <laughs> and so um, what we need to remember is that I could die now, and people are like, but yeah, but then who will take care of my family? Who will do this? And we always have these reasons why we can't die yet or what have you. And my opinion is if God's as powerful as he is, then he can easily take care of my family. He can easily make sure my kids are taken care of. He can easily protect my wife. Not that saying that I don't need to be here anymore. That's not saying that. That's just saying if God is truly sovereign like we believe he is, then death should not scare us. It's going to be scary because we're, we always fear the unknown as far as that we don't know if it's going to hurt. We don't know what this stuff. We don't know how it's going to be. Uh, are we mentally prepared for it? We may say we are now, but at the moment, we all, you know, we may not be. 
Um, but that's why we have to have a right understanding of life and a right understanding of death. And so hearing this, especially to the early church where death was on the line, and who knows, one of these people reading this could have been one that was, that was martyred uh, as, as a candle at Nero's uh, cocktail parties. We don't know. But this is to say, look, fear not what's about to happen to you. Because even if death is what happens, that's, that's not the end. For those of us who are not believers, it's a far more fearful event. Verse 19, write therefore the things you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels to the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So we see that it's the seven churches. My personal belief, some people say, oh, so does every church have an angel that watches over it? Well, angel, anybody know what the term angel means in the Greek as far as what it's portraying? Messenger. Messenger. And so uh, it could be that. Like a, an, a, an actual angelic being over each church. Uh, I tend to believe that that's more or less talking to the messengers of the church, which would be the elders of the church that are called to portray the me- or proclaim the message. Um, it, to go back to your question, it may have been the elders that came and picked up the letters from, from him, or maybe he was able to get the letters out. Um, if God can do what he did with John, I'm sure God could figure out a way to get those letters to the seven churches. But how he did that, we're not told. So it could be that he had somebody that he was able to give them to that went around. Or maybe he was visited by uh, other brothers or sisters in the faith. Well, I was mainly wondering because, of course, like you said, Caesar said he was God. And so anyone saying he wasn't, especially in such a Mm. bold letter, would probably want to attack the churches. Yep. Including who wrote the letter. So it just seemed like he would, of course, never give it away. (laughs) Well, that was, um, let me see, where is this? Have you ever heard of a message in a bottle? I don't know if that would have happened, but maybe. Clearly, the bottles did not exist. Message in a bottle. Yeah, so verse 5, where it said, well, I'll read just before, um, where it says, Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the, the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. That is a damning statement to write. Like, you, you say that to, not to, obviously, us as Christians, but to Caesar. Like Caesar reads that or anybody who works for Caesar reads that or you read that out loud proclaiming in your church and there's a government official there that hears that. That's blasphemy to your king and that's instant. You're done. And so you're told that you're blessed if you read this out loud because you reading this out loud is basically telling Caesar what you think of him and what you truly think of God. So, So that's chapter one. So chapter 2 is going to enter into where we're going to actually say something that God specifically wants a message said to these seven churches, and we're going to see what those messages are. Some of them are very encouraging. Some of them are very frightening because some of the churches were not doing what they were supposed to be doing. And so we want to then, as we look at those messages, we'll do chapter 2 and 3 next time, uh, we want to test ourselves what who are we as a church as we look at what God is saying to these churches? And are we going to be found faithful where some of the churches were, but some were not? And that's why I think it's so important for us as the men of the church. We've got to be the rock that says, look, if we're there, we hold that line. If we're not there, then we need to be willing to do whatever we need to do to get to where we need to be so that we can be everything that this church needs and everything that God has called us as men to be. So, yes. I was also curious, you were specific on stating that this is specifically written towards them. It's not written towards America 2020. Mm-hmm. So, what about the blessings and stuff? Wouldn't that also relate to them? Mm-hmm. Well, and the blessing is about whoever reads these words out loud. So, it's basically now saying any the, the believers that hear this, so now it's going from that was written specifically to the seven churches, but then they were also copied and read out to different people. So it's basically saying 
whoever reads this and is willing to take a stand against the culture and the world and declare that Jesus is Lord versus right now our biggest fear in America is that who, who's Lord of America? Like when we say if, if someone's going to be the Lord, who do we look to now? I don't know if I'm saying that right. You mean the leader, like emperor type? Yeah, no, let me say. Basically, what I'm trying to get, right now, itself is Lord. Like, we are our own gods, basically. We look at, we're in a huge self-help movement, huge self-lifting up. It's all about me, 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 me. I am my own destiny. I can create my own path. I'm going to do everything. I have my own truths. I have my own truths. And so that's the, the that's where we live right now. Um, I believe that's changing, but... Even if it doesn't, that's still us saying, reading this out loud, saying, no, you're not your own God. You belong to another, and he's the one that's, that's Lord. And so we proclaim that. Cool. Great question. Any questions about anything? or? So I can stop watching the Midnight Religious shows. I'd probably really recommend good. that. But. <laughs> yeah, not, but it just that destroys all of them. Oh, yeah. Yep. And I say religious for a whole reason. That's mm-hmm. There, but the, the thing is, is end time sells. It sucks you in. Everybody, I mean, that if you want to make money in religion, say you've got a word from God about the end times and make up whatever you want and then say it and you can get on talk shows and you can, you can get book deals and, and everything. But when you actually sit and study this word and study it in context, you see a completely different story. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to first see it how they would see it and understand it. And it's going to get crazy. I'm sure you guys have at least heard or read and maybe probably have read Revelation. It's going to get crazy. But it still had a meaning to the people who were reading it. They weren't sitting there scratching their heads. They understood what was being said. So now we have to understand as they would have understood it and then be ready to. I like what he says. Uh, someone's interpretation of Revelation doesn't bless its hearers and something's something's wrong yeah, yeah. That, that got me. so my goal from from chapter one that i hope that you're blessed with is seeing jesus as he was displayed as not just the the meek person that we see holding a sheep or whatever or walking you know footprints in the sand not that these are bad things i'm just saying we look at jesus as the meek and mild and we don't often look at jesus as the all-powerful warrior and this is helping us see that we mu- we fear not what's happening in this world, what's happening in this election, what's going to happen after it, that we fear no man, but God is going to take care of everything. And he's the one that we need to focus on. So it's a beautiful, a beautiful look at, at who Jesus is and and that, you know, he America is nothing compared to Jesus. The world is nothing. The world is going every knee and tongue will bow and, and confess. So whether whether now, which would be good, or if they go to the deathbed without it, then they will open their eyes and they will kneel and bow one way or the other. So you know one thing that strikes me is that, you know, we a lot of times, you know, our minds are so wrapped up, you know, on, on different things and and sort of we're not really walking in the victory that Christ has given to us. But this mm. chapter 1 really provides like such confidence to the believers that we have such a great confidence because we have such a powerful God. But there's another side, too, that this powerful God is going to protect those who we love. But there is a judgment coming towards people that do not love him. I mean, he's going to judge the churches in a little bit mm. and saying, I have this against you. And, you know, that's a terror... That's a, that's a really horrible thing to think about that people without Christ are going to fall into a, into a dreaded scenario before a holy God. And I think we've got such a great God that we need to try to, try to tell people about this because, I mean, we've got a message. And, you know, you don't have to do this. But it's a great. Let me close out in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this time that we've been able to set aside for your purpose and your glory and to hear from you and to know about you. Uh, Father, we pray that you would help us, uh, like Matt said, just rest in who you are and, and know the greatness of you and the power of you and the majesty of you. Father, help us to just meditate on that through the week. 
uh, tomorrow as we go to the abortion clinic, help us remember that that you are even Lord in the darkest areas and help us to proclaim uh, your goodness and your grace and that you are a God that loves and saves and that you can save them at that moment. So we pray that you would open their eyes and hearts tomorrow as we proclaim the gospel and that you would do a mighty work there. We pray for the protection of John and, and us that will be down there and uh, keep us safe. And we pray also for this church, Father, that you would uh, protect us, that you would guide us, that you would strengthen us for whatever battle you have coming for us. May we stand strong, may we stand firm, and may we not back down for whatever you have planned. And may we always be confessing Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.